Uh, hello there, welcome to Prague Chattery 777. Talking about Genesis, we've made it to a trick of the tale. This is the first album with the um, second major Genesis lineup. I guess third, when you talk about Anthony Phillips. Um, and Phil Collins has stepped up from the drum set and is now singing. Uh, he's still drumming, obviously. He drummed all the way through the rest of their career, but now he was their singer. Um, so how did they get to this point? Well, uh, Gabriel decided to leave after the uh, uh, so, er, the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway tour. Um, and obviously, you know, at this point in the band's career, this is 75, uh, you know, that was kind of their, their token. Their, their, they were known for Gabriel's weirdness and his costumes and... Uh, um, you know, that was a major part of the Genesis thing. However, they were all writers. The whole band wrote all the songs up, you know, they, you know, they were, they were all writers. They all contributed to, you know, different parts of songs. They all contributed separate songs individually. Um, so, I mean, it's not like the, it's not like the music was necessarily in any jeopardy. They just lost their front man. So they went through a long and exhaustive search and they, um, held a whole bunch of auditions and no one could quite do it. Phil Collins was teaching everybody the songs anyway, because they they had written the songs already for the album. Um, and you know, one day they just decided, you know what, screw it, Phil, just just sing the songs, just be the singer. And Phil Collins reluctantly obliged that. He he didn't necessarily want to become the singer because he was the drummer and he was a very very good drummer, but one of the best drummers in the world at that at this point. Um. So, reluctantly, Phil Collins takes the lead vocal thing. And I think, you know, that really was a smart move, because Collins had already sang lead on a couple of Genesis songs. He sang lead on uh, More Fool Me from Selling England, and he sang lead on uh, For Absent Friends on Nursery Crime. He was also the backing vocalist. His voice is heard all over the, you know, the previous albums. So, it, it's kind of a smooth transition. And Collins and Gabriel, it, it's funny, like when, when you first get into Genesis, you think, oh, they sound alike, but then the more you listen, you're, you know, they are they are very different singers, but there's kind of a certain tonal quality they have that's similar. So, you know, it, this album really isn't a huge leap at all from what they were doing before. In fact, this is the first time Genesis kind of looked back, because if you look at the rest of the albums before, you know, I've talked about this before, every album builds on the last. They jump a little farther ahead each time. They, uh, in my opinion, they they hit perfection with Selling England. They took one more step into the stratosphere with The Lamb Lies Down, perhaps a little too far, and ended up destroying the band, essentially. Or not destroying the band, but it, 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 it at the time would have been seen as damaging to the band. Um, and obviously, knowing that they lost their front man, for this album, they really consciously tried to create like the best Genesis album that they possibly could. So they were looking back at Selling England at Foxtrot, and they they really wanted to capture the essence that made those albums so good. So it's kind of a reflective album in that sense that you know they're 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 just they're not stepping forward now. Now they're looking back to you know make another Selling England, I guess. This isn't another Selling England though. This is this is its own album, obviously. Um, but that that's an interesting an interesting point to be made about Trick of the Tail. Um, but it is really good. I mean, it is a, it is a classic, a little bit of prog rock from that time period, '76, uh, I think. Yeah, I think it says '76. Mm, yes, yes, there it is. Um, yeah, beautiful album cover too. It's uh, it's it just this seems very Genesisy. Uh, like 70s, early 70s genesis -y. And each one of these characters illustrates one of the songs. Nice little gatefold there. You know, it looks whimsical. It's got... It's got, uh... Everything about this is genesis -y, at least up until that point. And there's some great music on it. Some really, really great music. Um, Colin's voice, obviously, I mean, he hadn't, he hadn't become the singer that he was eventually known to be. Um, but, you know, his voice is okay. I mean, it, 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 he almost sounds like he's trying to do a Peter Gabriel impersonation on some of the songs, but, uh, you know, he, he got past that and found his own. Um, and again, he's, he's not as dynamic a singer as he used to be, because he, you know, 
it's that squ it's that schoolboy choir boy kind of singing, just you know, hitting the notes and and whatnot. But I think it contributes to the quality of the album, and it makes it feel a little more you know reminiscent of the earlier Genesis albums. Um, so yeah, I mean other, other than the fact that Gabriel left, the lineup is has remained unchanged. We still got Collins on drums, and vocals now. Uh, Mike Rutherford on guitar, Tony Banks on keyboards, and Steve Hackett on um, guitar. Rutherford on bass, sorry. Uh, and yeah, so let's take a look at the songs then. Slide one opens with Dance on a Volcano. Now, this is definitely a classic from this four man period of Genesis. Uh, I think this is the. Um, it's, not, it's not like the flagship song, but it is really, really, really good. It's got. Uh, Kind of a cool guitar, hack it, guitar intro, some weird rhythms come in, great build up, very kind of orchestrated and whatnot, and then uh, I think the, the verses are just so cool. Really, really cool, very syncopated and um, jarring at times, really. And then again, the Colin's voice is, is it's kind of got that schoolboy quality, but the music behind it is just so good, you can't help but to be into it, and you, you follow along. Um, and yeah, it, it is, it is a, that kind of classic prog thing, but it's not, it's, it's not like, uh, it's not like a, the musical box or anything, where it, it, it starts in one place and it works its way and into, it ends in another place. It is, that there is kind of the reprise, there is a chorus, you know, you better start doing it right, that whole thing. And, um, yeah, you know, it's got a little middle section. I mean, it is a bit verse chorusy, verse chorusy, but the obviously the intro is wicked and the outro is fantastic. That boom, do 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 do, just absolute madness. And th that fusiony quality that Genesis had been, you know, could be traced back to Nursery Crime with uh, Fountain of Salmasis, but the very fusiony, particularly this and the set and the second album by the Four Man lineup, um, just great, great bit of playing. Then we get uh, Entangled is the second song on side one. Um, this, is, this is another classic little bit of Genesis, very very reminiscent of um, some of the, the acoustic-y stuff on Foxtrot or Nursery Crime, the arpeggiated guitar, acoustic guitars, the 12 strings. Um, very, very whimsical, and the, the end is, is fantastic. It's kind of got this long build-up and a bit of a synthesizer, um, you know, Tony Banks kind of stuff. I love the choir effect. He he introduced that back on Selling England and uh, uses it to great effect at the end of Entangled. Really, really good song. I like the lyrics too. Uh, uh, with uh, what is it? With your consent, we can experiment further. So, uh, well, thanks to our kindness and skill, we'll have no trouble until you catch your breath and the nurse will present you the bill. I think it's I think it's talking about. There's, obviously, there's a medical thing, but it might have to do with mental illness. I don't know. It's just a great song. Then we get Squonk. This is uh, another one of the classic classic songs from this period. Um, kind of the big riff song. I guess they were trying to sound like Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. It sounds nothing like Cashmere. Um, it's still kind of got different sections to it. Um, songs about this little creature that, when captured, it's it's so ugly and it's it, it, it'll cry itself into non-existence. Again, it's that whimsical, silly kind of a thing. Apparently, it's an American folk tale, you know, in the uh, New England area of the states, from you know, the ancient tale, really. But really good. I, I I love the different sections to it. It is very. This, there's some great drum fills too. Two great drum fills too, courtesy of Phil. Um, yeah, really really good song. And we get four Madman Moon. This is the the Tony Banks uh, piece. You know, all, all these albums had the Tony Banks piece, very piano oriented, typically very gentle. Um, just kind of like, um, I guess the Lamia from uh, Lamb and um, uh, Firth of Fifth from Selling England. The big Banks piece. Tony Banks really dominates on this album. I think, uh, you know, he was a really strong head. Always had been a really strong head in Genesis, and now that Gabriel was gone, I mean those two, Gabriel and Banks, were really the 
you know, there, there was never really a leader in the band, but they were probably the most influential. They were, they were the best at manipulating the other members. So now that Gabriel was gone, I think Banks kind of had a he had a free for all on this one, because he's he's gets a writing credit on every single song, which the other members do not. But yeah, Mad Mad Moon is really really good. I love I love the uh, instrumental section in the middle. Very tasteful, very classy. Um. I wonder how well it suits Colin's voice. I guess it suits it well, but I mean, there's a different there. There is a difference with you know you you can see even with the Tony Banks kind of numbers, Phil's voice, and and he was still getting used to it, right? I mean, he he never really wanted to be the singer on this album. He just happened to become the singer. Um, but it, I no, I take that back. I think his voice is suited for Man Man Moon. Um, Dance on a Volcano and Squonk maybe the questionable ones. Anyway, that's that's side uh, that's side one. We flip it over. We get side two. Uh, this opens with robbery, assault, and battery. This is their obligatory silly song. They always had a silly song. Um, it, it's okay. It it has lots of the proggy qualities. There's lots of complex bits and whatnot. This is where Collins really tries to do the Peter Gabriel impress impersonation. He's kind of doing the silly voices and the. Um, you know, the theatrics that Gabriel has done, and he doesn't quite pull it off, because, I mean, he's Phil Collins, he's not Peter Gabriel. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, it's just, it's just a, a, a typical song on the album, I guess. We move on to number two, which is Ripples. Um, another acoustic bit, side two is equivalent to Entangled on side one. I think I like Entangled better. Ripples is the more famous song. Uh, but it's a bit too long for me. It's very, very long, actually. It's eight minutes. Um, they probably could have taken one of the verses out, maybe. I'm just, I'm trying to be critical here. But the middle section in Ripples is absolutely fantastic. With, you know, Collins just on the hi-hat there. Uh, really great stuff. And then another Banks kind of highlight there in the, the middle section of Ripples. It's a good song. Three, we got Trick of the Tail. Uh, another another Banks song written just by Banks. It's, it's different from the other ones, though. It, this is kind of Banks trying to do his first attempt at a pop song, I guess. Uh, it's it's good. It's I, I love the piano uh, melody there, the piano riff. It's very Beatlesy. Sounds a lot. You can tell that they were fans of the Beatles, but then everyone was a fan of the Beatles. <laughs> not really a sign of what was to come. It's not as poppy as what they eventually did, but. It shows that they were open to doing that kind of thing. They weren't. They were. They weren't interested in exclusively being, you know, crazy prog band. They did have, you know, ambitions to be the pop, or to to do the pop thing. And if you look at their first album from Genesis to Revelation, that's just it's an album of pop songs. They did come full full circle, to, you know, ultimately. Um. Yeah. I guess, I guess the title track you could call that a classic. I always enjoy it. Then we finish up. This is the flagship song, possibly for all of Genesis, possibly just for the four-man lineup. But we get Los Endos. Uh, this is the this is like the peak of their fusiony kind of stuff. I think it, the instrumental reprises a whole bunch of things on the album, and it follows that tradition that was started on Selling England, where the beginning and the end of the album are bookended. There's a you know some kind of theme. You get bits of dance on a volcano on Los Andos. You also get a bit of squonk in there. So they're taking little bits and pieces from the album and putting it into a big wind-up. And there's just some stellar playing on it. A lot of twists and turns. A lot, a lot of moments that you don't really expect. Uh, and Collins did this in the 90s with his big band. And it's absolutely fantastic. You know, it's really suited to a big band. I mean, it's a very, very jazzy track. But high energy. Fusion is the right word. Um, and then there's there's a little nod to Gabriel at the very end. It, it uh, goes into this kind of weird, creepy instrument or atmospheric section, and then it finally boom, 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 down, 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 back into the squonk theme, and it just kind of riffs on that for a bit, and then you hear Phil Collins throw a couple of lines from Supper's Ready in, in there, just at the very end. I guess it's a nod. Not uh, you know there was no acrimony between the members. Uh, that's all baloney. And it's proven there by the fact that there's a little tribute just to acknowledge his uh, his importance to the band. But yeah, it, it's it's a really good album. It's not my favorite. Uh, I 
I, I, I'm very conflicted. I, I often wonder, do I like this more than The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway? The answer is no. I think The Lamb is is, is better just you know by default of The Lamb is a highly experimental and it's a band firing on all cylinders even though it's falling apart. Uh, and this is, this is, you know, let's sound as Genesis as we possibly can sound. And it's a good thing. I mean, they, they do a good job. And they kind of had to do that to survive. I mean, if they kept experimenting, then people would would have lost interest. But because they lost their singer, they lost their, you know, front man, they lost their the theatrical kind of aspect to what they were doing, they kind of had to look back and give the fans what they wanted, so to speak. And you know what? They did a damn good job, because this is a very good album, and worthy of anyone's anyone's collection, I believe. Uh, and I think that's all there is to say about uh, Trick of the Tail. Um, yeah, it is a classic piece of Genesis, a classic piece of 70s prog. Check it out. If you haven't heard it, check it out. And, you know, don't, don't, don't hate on Phil Collins just because he had a lot of success in the 80s. He did a lot of really cool stuff as well. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's it for Trick of the Tail. Thanks for watching. Hit uh, subscribe, throw me a like if you like, and we will see you next time for Wind and Weathering. We'll see you later.